Dr. Enrique there? Yes, I am. Let me just uh, connect the camera. All right. Oops. Uh, let me change. Just a minute. So maybe all the panelists can do the same and uh, connect the camera, please, if possible. Okay. Hi. How are you? That's it. Hi. Good, morning. Good to see you, Dr. Enrique. How is everything? Good to see you too. Yeah. Yeah. Last time it was in Addis, isn't it? Exactly. It was in Addis. Yeah. It was uh, before the new normal. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> but anyway, we have to deal with it. Exactly. Okay. All right. Are we all, or is someone missing? I see uh, Dr. Mold is there, uh, Mr. Luis Nicasio. Yavin. Okay. Mr. Stefan Kratz is also there. There is only one missing. Yeah. yeah. But struggling to connect, but Farah will take care of that. Perfect. All right. Just working something here. I think it's going to be a, a very good webinar. I'm quite confident because we have received more than. Uh, 250 registrations, so which is a very good number. That's great to hear. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, of course, we, we have outstanding panelists and uh, uh, our partners in Angola are quite active. So uh, it's really a very good opportunity. I would consider Angola a very successful story within Ireland. I can say that. So, uh, maybe Farah, you can start with the ISO corporate video, and uh, maybe we could start in about uh, yeah five minutes just after the video. Economic zones are becoming the most popular instrument supporting social economic growth and has significantly contributed to the overall GDP across the African continent. Over 189 economic zones have been developed and more than 57 ongoing projects have been announced for completion. For the last five years, the implementation of economic zones in Africa has generated over 60 million jobs in various sectors, including agro-processing, manufacturing and services. Founded in November 2015 by Tangimed Group, Africa Economic Zones Organization is striving to promote knowledge sharing, enhance and sustain relationships within the African Economic Zones ecosystem. It offers dedicated support to its members with devoted focus on growth and prosperity. African Economic Zones is the sole representative of Economic Zones in Africa and it comprehends today of more than 76 members representing 40 countries.
The organization assists African economic zones in projects, deployment, activities, and supports their go-to market initiatives. It also aims to foster business trade and stimulate industrial investment. Africa Economic Zones Organization assists its members in implementing international standards and best practices. It contributes to the development of a knowledge-driven marketing and communication strategies. Africa Economic Zones Organization designed the first dedicated economic zones database. It includes an atlas outlook, data assessment and analysis of African economic zones and investment framework. It has also developed an online exchange platform, a knowledge bridge between economic zones and international experts community. Through its training and capacity building programs, Africa Economic Zones Organization connects its members to an audience of professionals and speakers, providing educational presentations and conferences related to their business. Thanks to its networking activities, the association empowers business alliances and partnerships with international organizations, global business network and investor communities. Africa Economic Zones Organization is an all-in-one platform to support economic zone development across the continent. Africa Economic Zones Organization, supporting economic zone development in Africa. Hola, please go ahead. Hi. We can start. We can start now. Perfect. So first of all, um, welcome to all of you who are joining us today in this panel. And I want to thank you also to the African Economic Zone Organization for organizing this space where we can really talk about what is happening worldwide in terms of for indirect investment and what is happening with special economic zones and more important how we can improve the investment conditions so that there is a sustainable economic growth in the region in Africa. Um, for today we have a quite good panelist to be honest. We are six in total and we are going to be discussing during the next hour more or less about what is happening from first hand. So to start today, we are going um, to be talking um, with uh, Antonio da Silva, who is going to provide us first of all, like some remarks and opening remarks about this panel. So please, Antonio. Can you hear, can you all hear me well? Yes, we hear you very well. Dr. Antonio, can you just switch on your mic? Yeah, so and I, just to, to give you, you like that. Can you hear yeah. me now? Yes. I can Fine. hear you perfectly. So okay, Antonio, for, for those of you who... No, it's perfect. So um, Antonio is the chairman of the board of directors of the Luanda Bengo Special Economic Zone. Um, this is um, one of the most important special economic zones in Africa. He has more than 20 years of professional experience working in the private and public sector. And he has had different um, jobs also in different industries, such as oil and gas, telecommunications and television. He was previously also a uh, president of the Agency for Promotion and Investments and Experts of Angola. And he works now also as a chairman of the board of directors of IPEX. So please, uh, Antonio, we are very happy to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for um, uh, having invited us to be part of this uh, great uh, event. We, we hope that we are going to be uh, uh, at the level of the expectations that you, you have uh, on uh, when it comes to, to Angola and specifically to the Special Economic Zone. I will make a, a brief uh, um, introduction to, to our Special Economic Zone. Uh, by saying, first of all, that uh, uh, it was created uh, and it's managed by, uh, 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 administered by Development Corporation of the Special Economic Zone. And we are located uh, in uh, the industrial park of uh, Vienna uh, with uh, uh, around covering uh, 
4,000 hectares of, uh, of land. And uh, it's important so that you, you get to know us. Uh, and in, for that, we, we have as a mission to, to offer quality infrastructure um, and to be open to, to uh, international uh, investors, to promote the, the relaunch of uh, the local industry, um, to foster the entrepreneurship and innovation, and to contribute to the diversification of uh, the economy. Where so we, we have a business development strategic plan, and under that uh, business uh, uh, development strategic plan, we have established uh, a vision and values. As you can see, um, our vision is to to be the investors' uh, no, number one choice and a mandatory reference in the management of infrastructure spaces. Our core values is to make our, all our save, uh, services knowledge of uh, uh, capacities available for investors and uh, also in respect and create conditions favorable to business, enjoy the benefits of all those advantages. Of course, we have established um, um, annual targets and under those annual targets, um, the, the management of the ZE is covering a restructuring process. So we've been since uh, 2018 uh, covering all main aspects that in our view were key to the success that we have been achieving so far. But of course, with this um, um, event and the contributions of the different panelists, we are going to assess and align in, in much a strong manner if we what we have achieved is in line with also world best practices. And if not, what is necessary to, 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 to be as such. So we are covering a period of five years from 2018 up to uh, 2023. And along <clears throat> that road, we, we, we have established um, per year uh, milestones so that by the end, we are able to ensure that we have in place um, uh, an ecosystem that is sustainable, both from financial, uh, financial side and also to, to be um, uh, uh, ongoing uh, space that could promote uh, investment, investment. Of course, we find that one of our main assets, if not the main one, are our people. So considering the HR um, an important success factor, we've been uh, having in place a solid, a consistent a policy of recruitment of a talented um, HR. Angola is a very young uh, population. In average, Angolans are around 18 years old. And that means that there is a, a huge potential in uh, getting uh, uh, those fellow country uh, men into and women into our environment and giving them a, an opportunity to develop their skills and to build up careers uh, at uh, uh, international uh, standards and according to the best practices. I don't know how much time I have for, for uh, the remarks, but I, I just want you to give a, a, an insight on exactly what we are going to be looking at. So, of course, that in order to, to develop a special economic zone, we had to have a, a master plan. And that master plan has been uh, built and uh, set up according to uh, world standards. And since we, 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 we were considering a very big um, area coverage, so the, the, the special economic zone comprises in total as it is now, but we are now in the process of redimensioning the space to 225,000 hectares. So it's huge, it's massive. So we cannot handle that and be efficient as we wish. So we are now in the process of uh, doing a, a restructuring of the full area. So this is not the coverage of um, the 225,000 hectares. This is just limited to, to the Viana, the location where I'm now. And uh, uh, to make it more uh, sustainable, we, 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 are, we, we believe that it's important to secure uh, what you can see now on this uh, uh, slide so that uh, effectively the, the conditions are in place, um, both from the infrastructure side and other important uh, elements uh, in order to make the presence of uh, investors the more pleasant one and the more uh, aligned with their business uh, plans and expectations. Uh, this is just a view on, uh, on, on, the, on the special economic zone on the industrial park of Vienna. 
as you can see, uh, there is quality infrastructure in place. And of course, uh, not only we need to, to bring forward uh, into the country investors, but we need also to align those, uh, um, those ones into uh, our main goals. So who can invest? Anyone. But anyone in what sense? In the sense that uh, we are an open uh, country to both for national and foreign investors. But uh, if they come, they need to be aligned with the development plan that the government has put together, which is called uh, Prodesi, 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 and covers up uh, 40, uh, 54 products. And under that uh, list of products, we, we cover all different kinds of, uh, of uh, industries. And uh, by doing so, we believe that we're going to boost uh, um, the local manufacturing. There is an example of uh, a company called Mestra Kino, and Mr. Luis Nicasio is the president of uh, that company. And he's also going to be able to, to join us and tell his story and how he managed to build uh, uh, his, uh, his project. So it, it is important to, to have the assistance from the institutional side, from the government side. And it was very supportive uh, since uh, uh, the reforms that have been in place in the country through the leadership of uh, President uh, Lorenzo are the ones actually that enable um, the current situation in terms of uh, development uh, of the special economic zone by putting in place a new management, but giving us the, the openness to develop a plan and to bring results and establish objectives. And based on that approach, we believe that we, we have been uh, um, giving uh, the, the good signals back in terms of uh, uh, the results so far achieved. On the investor's profile, um, the current ones, uh, on the current situation, we have 60% of those that are from the manufacturing sector. 30% uh, from the commercial sector and, and the remaining one, 10 percent are from the service sector. Uh, it is important also to look at Angola as a, um, an opportunity for export. And in that sense, um, we see as a, a potential market, as you can see on this slide, uh, based on the trade uh, rates between 27 and 2018, the export markets from Angola were covered mainly from, from Asia, 22% were um, uh, Europe, 16% the U US, and the remaining one is distributed between Latin America and Africa. It is important also to say that the ones that are related to Africa, they have been a very interesting one, and because we see that there's more and more integration into the African market space with companies that have already been established in the trade business in Angola, but now they are converting their operations into um, manufacturing industries. And that's a very also positive sign. I believe that I will just touch on one aspect that was key in what we have achieved so far was the customer care. And was also the fact that we, we moved um, from a, um, a quite bureaucratic way of dealing with the the presence of investors in, in our uh, special economic zone to one that has reduced the first the time, the response times to their uh, own needs, uh, response times in terms of uh, the documentation that they had to, to have uh, to present to, to, to us to, so that we can approve the project and, and also for the times to, to that took to them to have the project up and running with all the licensing that's necessary. Now we want to develop an even more close relationship through uh, an implementation of ICT platforms that are going to be assisting us in having on online all the stream, uh, stream, streamline all the processes so that decision making is much efficient and less time consuming. Uh, Perfect. Well, uh, I believe that uh, I have covered pretty much uh, everything, but I will just say that uh, one more thing is regarding the acquisition opportunity, since we are now in the process of uh, privatization, and there are some interesting assets that are part of the, the privatization process. Some of them uh, that are referred on this list have been already privatized, but this is just a showcase to, to, uh, for you to understand that the government is actually working uh, on getting Angola, both from the, the doing business perspective in a better, better position, 
but also moving the government involvement, direct involvement into the economy by privatizing uh, to the private sector. Thank you very much. And once again, uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to present ourselves and looking forward for a, for the, a good uh, panel, a good um, uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think that this provides definitely like a very good basis to start with this discussion today. There are some takeaways. One is human talent. There is also infrastructure and government support, which are essential for special economic zones like yours. I would like to introduce now to Ahmed Benis, who is the Secretary General of the Africa Economic Zones Organization. He has an extensive experience implementing large industrial infrastructure and logistic investment projects in Africa. And he has worked not only with economic zones, but also with private companies over the last years. So um, Ahmed, could you please tell us a little bit more about the advantages of having a special economic zones and a little bit about the history of these zones in, in Africa? Thank you, Paula. And thank you, Dr. Uh, Enrique. Uh, good morning to, to, to all of you. I'm, of course, very pleased to be here with you in the opening of this uh, webinar session. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot meet in person, but uh, I would say let's use the best of this technology to exchange our views and experience on such important topics. Uh, we use within ISO to reiterate this exercise through a regional workshop, but Today, uh, let's say with the COVID-19 restrictions, uh, we are using the Zoom technology to be very close to our members and to be uh, very close to our uh, community. Um, first of all, I, I wanted to express my thanks again to Dr. Antonio for hosting this uh, uh, ISO workshop under the team of improving investment conditions to accelerate the economic zones development and the case of Luanda Bengo as is is uh, quite uh, prominent and very uh, and very interesting and I would like to uh, let's say to highlight that all what Mr Enrique has mentioned is uh, definitely uh, let's say the right uh, prototype that we want to duplicate uh, across the, uh, across the continent I wanted also to give uh, special kudos to um, the let's say the organization team uh, to bring together such fine group of experts from UNIDO, UNECA, as well as the representative of the investors community in Luanda Bengo, uh, special economic zones. So for the ones who don't, who don't know uh, our organization, so we are the representative of the African economic zones community. We gather more than 80 members representing 45 African countries. And uh, as of today, there are more than 189 operating economic zones in the continent, and uh, 57 projects have been announced for completions. And uh, since uh, in its inception, the African Special Economic Zones have given a significant boost to FDI flows, creating an attractive investment conditions and also supporting job creation. Uh, over the last five years, uh, 60 million jobs have been created uh, in agro-processing, industrial fields, and services. So uh, today's deliberations would address uh, issues of common interest. Uh, we'll talk about uh, investment attraction, industrial development, SEZ management, but with the objective to highlight the importance and the potential of the economic zones, mainly at this uh, crucial time. Um, indeed, we... Uh, I mean, the African economic zones are facing an uncertain period as the COVID-19 disrupts their activities and hinder their operations due to the lockdown restrictions. And most African economic zones are reliant on manufacturing and export-led export activities that suffered from, uh, from all these restrictions. But the global pandemic has also put the diversification of the global value chain at the center stage uh, involving the economic zones as a major stakeholder to implement innovative policy. So the new wave of the global supply chain uh, could definitely provide opportunities to expand into new fields of uh, activities, new sectors, and lead to a new stimulus through implementing, of course, the new investment conditions and accelerating the SEZ development. Um, on the other hand, 
The SEZs are also involved in improving the intra-African trade, enhancing the Africa's industrial performance, supporting the regional and continental value chain um, in contributing to the expansion and diversifications of the continent productive uh, capacity. Um, in the, and in the, in the recent years, the SEZ concepts have also, have also evolved to be more creative with a great focus on integrations with the local economy. So, but there are more of, more for, uh, some fundamentals that must be taken into consideration in order to make sure that, the, uh, that, that there is a greater prob a probability of success in building the SEZ connections and linkage with the, the local economy and implementing innovative strategy that supports uh, public-private initiatives. So uh, we could consider, for instance, I mean, as a first fundamental, that the SEZ should bring the transformational change to the country by attracting quality FDI that can help in creating economy-wide jobs, better skills, industrial upgrading, and of course, a productive local private sectors. Second fundamentals is uh, on, the other, on the investor side, we have noticed an important development in global FDI trend, which is the rise of efficiency seeking investors. So this kind of uh, investors are increasingly looking for a wide range of productivity incentives in terms of skilled workforce, uh, efficient logistics, and supportive in uh, infrastructure rather than only fiscal benefits. Third fundamental is the regional trade and integrations would definitely foster the SEZ business value propositions and the investors and industrialists would definitely be encouraged by a greater regional integration that would offer a larger nearby market and greater sourcing opportunities. And this would of course support the local private sector development, job creations uh, in, the regional, uh, in the regional economies. So we are entitled to implement uh, better investment conditions for our SEZ, develop new processes for the supply chain, supporting the vision of creating, of creating one African market under the African Continental Free Trade Agreement that stands for making a significant contribution to accelerate the SEZ development and reducing the logistic transaction costs, offering more competitiveness and facilitating the cross-border uh, trade. So um, for Luanda Bengo SEZ and all African SEZ, this is a window of time. So it's time to reflect what extra services we could bring by, by observing the market signals that we, we should tap into. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you very much for this, uh, for this initiative. I wish you a fruitful deliberation and a very pleasant and informative webinar. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Um, before we proceed with, with the whole discussion, I want to remind to all the participants that the event is also in Portuguese. So it's in English and Portuguese for all of you. And if you have any questions, please feel free to submit it. And we will have them answer if, if the time allows us at the end of, of the session. So I want to, to just start exactly with one point that you previously mentioned and it's uncertainty. Uh, the reality is that at this moment we are uh, facing a, a huge challenge worldwide uh, as society, as humans, um, according to the World Uncertainty Index, uh, which is an index that evaluates over 140 economies worldwide. The, the uncertainty level at the moment is higher than ever, and this translates in many, many aspects. Um, one of them is that the FDI flows for this year are expected to be decreasing by up to 40%, according to the UNCTAD. And this is something that definitely makes us to innovate and see how the special economic zones can provide an added value and how can they like more or less adapt to these challenging times. So the aim of this panel now is basically to understand the advantages of having a special economic zones and provide an overview of some of the policies, regulations, and measures that governments can adopt to improve the investment conditions to continue attracting investment to the regions 
that translate in new jobs and generate a sustainable economic development. So to discuss all these topics, we have four panelists now with us. Um, Yavin Wu is the head of the Unido Investment and Technology Promotion Office. More precisely, he is working in the Department of Digitalization, Technology and Innovation. And he has an extensive knowledge of trade and industrial policies. Yavin, thank you very much for joining us today. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. We also have uh, from Unido, Stefan Kratz, who works as Industrial Development Officer in the Department of Trade, Investment and Innovation too. He has more than 15 years of professional experience at this organization and has specialized in all the topics related to investment promotion and private sector development. He has been also part of the UNIDO team designing and implementing UNIDO's African Investment Promotion Agency Network Program and has recently started the inception phase for a major regional investment promotion program for Africa, Caribbean and Pacific countries in cooperation with the World Bank Group. So Stefan, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much, it's my pleasure. We also have Andrew Mold, who is the Chief of Regional Integration and AFC FTA cluster at UNICA. Uh, he has a background in politics and economics and understands very much all the topics related to investment promotion and investment attraction. He is now precisely work, is working on strengthening the member states' capacity in Eastern Africa to formulate evidence-based plans and policies for the region. So, Andrew, thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon, should I say. Good afternoon. Yeah. Um, last but not least, we have Luis Nicasio, who is the CEO of Mestre Aquino Factory, an industrial and agribusiness corporation, Filos de Luis Nicasio. He's also former chairman at Kwanza Norte Business Association in Angola. And thanks to his position, he can explain us more about how is it to operate in a special economic zone and what are the advantages and the challenges that these uh, zones have at the moment. So thank you very much, Luis. Bon dia, obrigado. Bon dia, obrigado. Bon dia. Um, to start, I would like to, to go with um, Yavin, I know that UNIDO works constantly with projects that create a sustainable development and particularly in Africa, you have been conducting a research on the value that special economic zones have. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about this uh, research and what are the main insights? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paula. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Yavin Wu, the head of ITPO Beijing. Uh, that is uh, the Investment and Technology Promotion Office, the investment branch of UNIDO in China. Uh, before I joined uh, in UNIDO, I worked for the Ministry of Commerce in China to promote the Made in China goods all over the world for the past uh, uh, two decades. Uh, and I've been to uh, Luanda, uh, Angola, fortunately. So uh, it's my pleasure to attend the webinar uh, at the invitation of ISO. I'd like to make a brief introduction of uh, several research findings uh, about the uh, special economic zone, the seas uh, of Angola and uh, Africa as a whole. And then I would like to try to give some of my uh, suggestions uh, from the perspective of uh, uh, investment promotion agency. So uh, the industrial parks uh, firstly started in Europe, as you know, uh, according to the World Investment Report 20. 19, released by the UN Conference on Trade and Development, uh, 147 countries and regions have established more than 5,400 industry parks by the June of 2019, and more than 1,000 parks had been built in the past five years. Uh, since the reform and opening up, one of the most important experience of China has been to use industry park as a hub and a focal point uh, for industrial concentration, uh, technology transfer, knowledge is built off, and uh, the construction of value chains. We are willing to share this practice uh, with the world. 
So in the year of uh, 2018, with the initiative and support of Gates, uh, Beer Gates, Beer and Mandel Gates uh, uh, Foundation, we organized experts and scholars at home and abroad to jointly compile a study on China-African development cooperation in the new era, which uh, was released during the Beijing summit uh, of the Forum of uh, China-African Cooperation on uh, September of that year. And uh, that uh, study uh, received an intensive response from the public. So during the process of the research, uh, we recognize that uh, the SEZ, the SEZ, is a very important policy tool for African future industrialization, urbanization, and uh, economic diversification. So China has a valuable know-how and the most practical uh, toolbox in uh, setting up SEZs and industry parks, which can be used for reference by African countries. Also, by the end of the year of 2000, uh, uh, 2018, there are more than 3,700 Chinese companies investing in Africa, uh, with a total stock of uh, direct investment of 46 billion US dollars. However, the investment environment in African countries and the development status of SEZs vary uh, greatly. So in order to assist the enterprises intending to go to Africa to access the necessary decision-making information for their investment, and also to choose the suitable host country and industry parks, we carry out the case study in African SEZs. So in the report, SEZs in five African countries, including Egypt, Zambia, Morocco, Kenya, and also Angola, are selected for case analysis, including Luanda, uh, Bengal, Seas, that is ZEE. -E. We mainly focus on the following four criteria when choosing our research cases. Uh, first is the uh, geographical characteristics. The second is the diversity of the type of SEZs. That means it includes all kinds of SEZs. And third is, is, is the different kind of investors. We include both the China-African Economic and Trade Cooperation Zone, as well as the seed run by African countries itself, like as the ZEE. And finally, we consider the development stage of the SEZs. For example, the Zambia-China Economic and Trade uh, Cooperation Zone and Kenya Export Processing Zone are both in their mature per period, we can see. Uh, however, the SEZ, uh, the ZEE, is in its infancy for a uh, uh, period. Uh, the report adopts a research method combining a, various, a variety of second-hand literature and the first-hand face-to-face -face interview and the inter uh, questionnaires. We conducted a survey to Chinese companies that have already invested and were planning to invest in Africa. The report is advocated and supported by UNIDO itself. Uh, as a public good uh, of knowledge sharing. The ITPU network and its coordination team both offer useful information in reaching the report to make it more complete and comprehensive by adding UNIDO's mission in Africa, as well as the contribution of uh, ITPO's uh, toward Africa, especially to its industry parks. According to the research, we found that the first major problem facing Angola is a shortage of funds for the construction of industry parks. Uh, of course, uh, we, we are, I, I'm very glad to know from uh, the chairman, Dr. Antonio, that uh, the plan of uh, uh, the EE is renewed and uh, redimensioned and restructured. But to our knowledge, due to uh, the lack of the fund, uh, the construction is uh, still slower than expected. The ZEE developed slowly and uh, had not been completed as planned by the, Jan uh, by the June of 2019 and can only guarantee uh, very basic services according to the enterprises a survey of water and power supply and also the monitoring and the security and the equipment and the leasing uh, is also uh, uh, lagged behind. So among the 19 three registered uh, companies, only 16 have finished the construction and five or fewer are still under uh, construction.
of course, that one might be uh, might not be uh, the newest uh, information. Uh, and the second pro problem is the uh, uh, foreign exchange problem, the foreign exchange shortage and its control by the country. Um, uh, the yeah, I mean, sorry yeah. to interrupt you a bit. Um, I've been asked if you could slow down a bit for the translation to, to work <laughs> oh. properly. Okay, okay, sorry. Uh, so uh, the single products industrial structure uh, with a very heavy reliance on the oil and energy sector uh, is a major feature of Angola's economy. So which are highly affected by the fluctuation of the international oil prices and the market. So the third problem is uh, political and the security risks. So in terms of a macro investment environment, you know, the government's management efficiency and the social security situation are always the important factors that the investors are concerned about. So according to the Chinese enterprises that participated in the questionnaire survey, there are the following problems in the EE. Oh, maybe some of them have already been sold, but I'd like to just uh, uh, show you. The ZEE's rule and regulations uh, are insufficient, insufficient according to them. The approval procedures are complicated and lengthy. Uh, of course, I'm very glad to know that the uh, decision-making uh, process has been uh, faster than before, but uh, this uh, brought uh, some inconvenience to the enterprises in operation project. And the second uh, problem is that the ZEE is short of fund of development, which I've mentioned, which leads to the inadequate infrastructure. I heard that uh, they uh, just complained that water and power cars occurred from time to time. So companies have to prepare their own emergency plans and their own cost. However, by ITPO Beijing, we see that the political environment of Angola uh, has become increasingly stable. The new government is actively taking measures to uh, crack down on the uh, country's corruption and disorder. And also, uh, the recovery of international oil prices will also help Angola to survive the economic downturn. Uh, now, you know, uh, uh, with, with, together with the pandemic. So the ZEE business environment is gradually improving as well. And uh, the future development of the EE is expected to be supported by the good economic fundamentals, I believe. So that's what our fundamental findings about the research. And maybe I will uh, listen to others sharing and uh, I will add my suggestions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I would like then to, to go with Andrew. Um, could you tell us what has been the East Africa's experience with the special economic zones? Have they been on balance successful and what kind of challenges have they confronted? What is your experience so far? Um, yeah, thank you for the question, Paula. Um, it's an interesting uh, experience, I think, East Africa, because uh, actually East Africa has almost half of the export processing zones uh, of the African continent. and. Uh, Kenya in particular, uh, 61 uh, special economic zones uh, accounted there in 2018. Um, now, a number of other countries in the region have also been trying to um, use export processing zones and special economic zones more effectively. So Ethiopia is one case that stands out. Um, Ethiopia has put a lot of efforts into its industrial parks program over the last uh, decade or so. I think it started really around um, yeah, 12 years ago, eight years ago. Um, and uh, they've focused on uh, industrial parks uh, in textile sector, for example, and uh, 18 zones across the country. Now, they've hit with a number of problems uh, related partly to political instability has caused some disruption to supply chains, for example. So they haven't been meeting their export targets, but they've done very well in terms of uh, logistical uh, arrangements there, for example, in the textile sector to hook up with uh, suppliers and uh, purchasers in Europe. Um, so the Ethiopian experience is an interesting one. Uh, the Kenyan one 
is also an interesting one for the diversity of the exported processing zones and simply the number of um, EPZs that they've, uh, they've set up. Um, Kenya actually, interestingly, uh, has recovered quite well from the current COVID-19 crisis in terms of exports. It's exports have recovered quite quickly. Uh, we noticed that um, some of the EPZs serving the American market, the clothing market under a GOA, um, has had some problems in recovering, fully recovering, but in other subsectors they've done very well. And I think that partly reflects the effectiveness of its um, EPZs. And then finally, there'd be another case which I'd like to point to is in Madagascar. And Madagascar uh, set up in the late, um, late 80s, actually, uh, an apparel export industry. And it was again based pressure principally around preferential market access. And they were doing quite well in terms of expanding the export of textiles, um, but they suffered through uh, the suspension in Agoa um, due to um, the political crisis that they suffered in 2008, 2009. And you saw a very sharp decline in their exports to the US market. And I think that tells us something important about the way export processing zones are often reliant on preferential market access to high income country markets um, that can work well under certain circumstances, but it does also create some vulnerabilities, I think, for, for export processing zones because of the impermanence sometimes of that preferential market access. So it's a bit of a mixed bag would be my summary there, Paula. You know, um, I think- Thank you. Region, I think in the region, there's a feeling that the export processing zones have played a role, but haven't perhaps been as efficiently organized as maybe. There was one assessment um, done a couple of years ago, which was expressing concern, for example, in places like Kenya and Tanzania and Uganda, where they found that the, the range of firms in the export processing zones was, too wide. There was no, okay. focus, no, no sectorial focus. And hence, there was a lack of linkages between the firms within the export processing zones on the one hand, and a lack of integration into the wider economy. So I think that's been a persistent con concern, I think, across Eastern Africa in terms of export. Okay. No, and it is interesting, I think, indeed, to get like an overview of the region to, to really go more into details in, in, each, in each one of the countries, especially with the, um, the case of, of Angola and what is happening there. Um, Stefan, I know that you work quite a lot in all the topics related to investment attraction as well. And this is sometimes a concept that it is easier to say, is easier to talk about, everyone wants to attract investments, but it is at the same time very challenging. So I know that from your experience, um, you could perhaps tell us a little bit more about how is it possible to increase industrial park performance through targeting aftercare and inclusive governance? Yeah, thank you very much, Paula. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Antonio, and also thank you, uh, Aeso, for, for inviting UNIRU to this very pertinent event. It becomes even more important as we speak about the the impact and the aftermath of, of COVID-19 and what the what the zones can, can bring in terms of attracting and retention of, of foreign direct investment. Um, from, from our point of view, uh, and I, I can underpin this with a couple of slides uh, I have prepared for this session, uh, it's important to look at investment promotion uh, holistically. It is, it is a cycle. Uh, it doesn't... Um, stop with the, uh, the, the production of a good website, the production of good corporate videos, flyers, uh, advocacy efforts, etc. for which I want to, by the way, uh, commend uh, ZEE of having done a very nice package, which should be very, very convincing for, for any potential investor. But it is important to, uh, to look at the different stages uh, of, uh, of, of, of foreign direct investment and, and specifically to see uh, how it evolves over time and that uh, it is not a static process, but uh, it evolves dynamically. So for this, um, uh, for this presentation this morning, uh, please go to the next slide, uh, Paula. 
Uh, yeah, for this presentation this morning, I want to base it a bit on uh, on UNIDO's uh, uh, consolidated work on special economic zones, uh, which uh, was recently uh, revamped and, and, and structured by a cross-disciplinary task force that UNIDO had established at the highest level. And uh, the objective of, of this work is to really provide a stepwise normative framework for uh, special economic zones establishment and development, uh, spanning the different steps of, of planning, which involves land acquisition, design and development towards operations and management, uh, industrial park regulations, uh, investment marketing and facilitation, risk management, as well as, and that's an important aspect, to constantly review how an industrial park is performing, not only uh, in terms of the sum of the uh, performance of the industrial parks tenants in terms of export being generated and, and, and profit margins, etc., but also to see how much has uh, uh, the attraction of tenants into the special economic zones really made a tangible impact on, uh, on industrial policy objectives. As we learned uh, this morning, those are anchored, for example, in the in the Prodesi, uh, which uh, now celebrates, I believe, its its second anniversary uh, in in the next um, second year anniversary in in the, in, the, in in this year. Next slide, please. So, um, so starting from uh, the an important success point for an special economic zone being successful or not it is quite important to look at sector identification and investment targeting at the very beginning and not just to let this uh, go organically because then in the planning uh, some of the, the things may already have been determined for example on, on how uh, uh, different industries are, are co-located on in the space how uh, how the energy supply is arranged how waste management is done how different industries are placed next to each other inside the industrial park, et cetera, et cetera. So some of these things, if they are let, let go without planning, uh, can then lead to additional costs of uh, reversing those uh, earlier decisions later on. So uh, looking at sector identification uh, and looking at Angola, I think what, what this and what was mentioned before, uh, there is a, a young population which uh, lends itself for a good narrative on attracting efficiency seeking foreign direct investment, such as in those sectors like um, textile garments, but also agro processing. Uh, Andrew mentioned the, uh, the window of Agoa. I mean, Ango Angola is part of Agoa, and that could still, and Angoa, Agoa still lasts till 2025. So that could still have sort of a five-year window in attracting industries uh, that want to seek advantages uh, under the AGOA agreement. Though, of course, the window is, 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 is not that long for, uh, for long-term strategic planning. The second determinant, uh, which could be attractive, is um, that Angola has a lot of uh, arable land. Um, as I researched 35 million hectares of arable land, of which only 16% are being used. Uh, and it has a lot of uh, a large variety of crops, coffee, tropical fruits, maize, soy, uh, sugarcane, etc., which at the moment uh, may be rather limited uh, processing is being done uh, to these agricultural crops. So here again, that could offer an opportunity to maybe replicate a bit the, 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 the successful example of Ethiopia, uh, which is building uh, um, agro-industrial parks uh, with a specific focus on agro-processing, um, which means these parks have to be well connected to, um, to farmers associations, cooperatives, uh, which can ensure constant supply of raw materials and so on. So these are just some of the factors on which uh, 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 the story could be built. What is important is to also look for quick wins. So um, if perhaps uh, a long-term target would be also to attract new industries, digital industries, uh, uh, software development, uh, uh, business process outsourcing, etc., that of course would come with a whole range of 
issues on skills developments, links to universities, etc., which uh, may be a long-term target and probably should be a long-term target, but may be currently a bit out of focus because uh, here maybe some other countries have, have a slightly more comparative advantage. Please go to the next slide. So, and that links to your, to your first question. So um, when we talk about investment promotion and, and UNIDO is working a lot with, with, with IPAs and special economic zones, et cetera, it is very important not to get stuck, let's say in the, uh, in the first two phases, which is the pre-investment stage and the entry stage, where a lot of the promotion is being done through fact sheets, uh, through the network of embassies um, and detailed information is provided to investors about the procedures, the regulations, the transaction costs, etc., which are necessary, absolutely necessary for them to, to, to take decisions and for, for specific sites to, um, to end up on shortlist of those investors. But then the, um, the very important and some unfortunately often neglected part uh, is those subsumed under the third phase and the fourth phase, which is when implementation starts and uh, when the investors are on the ground and they start to start to have issues which uh, require swift and efficient uh, solutions by not only the, the, the management uh, company or the, the manager of the park, but also swift support by uh, different institutions and, and, and policymakers and so on. And this is the objective of a one-stop shop uh, to bring everyone together, uh, but do not make it a, a one more stop shop as, uh, as one can often hear. So um, it means uh, 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 coordination of different ministries is, is absolutely key. And then we enter this area of uh, aftercare support where tenants in the park, um, they may have specific issues with customs, they may have specific issues on uh, tax regulations or labor regulations, or they want to find service providers, uh, companies that can help them uh, on legal advice, or they want to find local suppliers uh, maybe those not inside the park, but also outside the park, etc. And here it's very important that um, the human resources that are available at the level of the industrial parks operator are not shifting completely away towards the attraction phase, but that there are sufficient uh, human resources to actually deal with these kind of grievances and issues. And the, um, the conclusion is very simple. First of all, if the tenants in the park are happy, they are going to reinvest. And uh, as we know from, from, from global FDI statistics, reinvestments already account for 50, if not 60% of all global foreign direct investment flows. So uh, that's something that uh, a country like Angola, of course, wouldn't like, want to miss out upon. The second point is, uh, a new investor, and uh, the, the study of Mr. Wu Jabin is, is, is pointing in this direction. Any new investor would uh, refer its inquiries to the investment promotion agency and so on, but it would want to listen to the existing investors as well, who live the, that experience, uh, that day-to-day -day experience. So by making those existing investors, investors happy, uh, they can in their own right become spokesperson and amplify any formal investment promotion efforts uh, that ZTE or other partners would be doing. The next one, please. Uh, the next slide. Perfect. Yeah, the next slide is also taken from, uh, uh, from this report, the International Guidelines for Industrial Parks that I referred to at the beginning. Uh, we are happy to share this. We, are, we were also happy to see that it is uh, features on IESO's website for download. So, so thank you for that. Um, so for a one-stop shop to really work well, uh, it's important that there is, um, first of all, 
uh, good interministerial coordination, uh, as I mentioned, and, and we, we understand that under PRODESI, it is planned uh, that uh, uh, there is a standing committee of some sort, uh, which brings all these different ministries together. Uh, and that is important because otherwise any issues um, could not be referred to a formal structure in higher level government. And then sometimes they end up with one line ministry, but it, that line ministry may only have a part of the solution, not the full solution. So that's at the, at the, at the policy level. Then at the, at the local level, it's important that the industrial park builds an ecosystem uh, with other institutions in the country, regional or national institutions. And they don't need to be only public sector, but they could also specifically involve uh, the chambers of commerce, universities, NGOs, and of course, uh, the investment promotion agency. So we are quite happy to see uh, that this is already part of uh, ZEE strategy to work with institutions like IPEX, uh, the Environmental Monitoring Unit, um, the General Tax and Revenue Authority, et cetera, which is already converging towards providing such a, a full-fledged solution. So this brings me to my, to my conclusion uh, of, 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 my, of this first intervention. Next slide, please is the key concluding points is uh, to align the industrial park strategy with the overall industrial policy uh, while underpinning comparative advantages and value chain sector targeting is, is very key. And here we see that uh, a lot was already done uh, um, at the level of, of, of PRODESI. The second point is um, for uh, the, 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 that there is some need of continuous capacity building of industrial park management uh, to provide those services throughout the investment cycle, as, as I mentioned. Um, the third point would be that one-stop shop services really work only if, uh, if, if it's inclusive to many ministerial institutional stakeholders. And if there is a formal standing committee uh, looking at industrial park governance, performance, and impact. And the fourth point uh, is uh, we learned there is quite a large number of industrial parks in, in Africa. And uh, uh, it's great to know that IESO has, has such an important role of being a custodian and a convener of those zones. But it also um, increases and augments the, the risk that there is some uh, race to the bottom or some adverse competition between those industrial parks, more or less basing their promotional strategy on the same macroeconomic fundamentals. So here again, what would be important is to, uh, to see how different industrial parks can cooperate together to start promoting regions rather than individual countries or sub-regions within the country. And mm -hmm. here we have the RECs, uh, Angola is part of SADC, Angola is part of um, uh, also the, uh, the uh, central, the REC in Central Africa, ECAS. Um, and of course, we have a, a new narrative which can be leveraged is, and that's the African, African Continental Free Trade uh, Agreement, where also Angola has already uh, uh, signed and uh, approved the ratification of the AFC FTA. So rather than having these parks competing with each other, we would be very happy and also to support from, from UNIDO's expertise to see how, how they can be more connected vertically to each other in the sense that how can buyers from one park maybe procure things from uh, processes located in another African industrial park and so on. So as to create regional value chains where the wealth and, and the, the know-how and, and the capacity is retained within, within the African continent and, and thereby boosting jobs uh, and exports and diversifying the, the economy. So thank you. Yeah, indeed. Um... What you mentioned about competition is key. Uh, the last year's report uh, from Special Economic Zones say that there are about over 200 uh, Special Economic Zones in Africa, if I'm correctly. And investment attraction is quite 
a very competitive field. There are two main points that are important investment attraction targeting new companies, but aftercare is definitely very relevant, especially in a moment like the, the one that we are living right now. And that's why I'm very happy that Luis is joining us today to precisely tell us his experience from his company established in a special economic zone. So Luis, um, can you tell us a little bit more about the, the experience, how it has been? Dr. Luis, o som, o som, tem que ter o som. Perfect. I could hear you now. Tá sim, tá sim. Ok, sim. Eu dizia muito obrigado, muito obrigado a todos. Estou feliz por estar, por estar aqui. Primeiro, eu gostaria de pôr um vídeo de dois minutos para perceber aquilo que a Mesta aqui no hoje faz na, na Zona Econômica Especial. O doutor Rui, se puder ajudar. Doutor Rui. Em 2014, Luís Nicásio fez uma aposta e decidiu colocar uma semente no ramo da indústria alimentar no país. Estamos a falar da fábrica de processamento de carnes e enchidos Mestre Aquino. Foi um projeto financiado ao abrigo, demos o nosso, entrada no nosso projeto ao abrigo do Angola, do Angola Invest. Na altura, financiamos pelo Banco Milena, Milena Atlântico e num valor de financiamento na ordem de 2.250.000 em projeto, tendo este projeto hoje um valor global de investimento de 4 milhões de, de dólares. Portanto, o restante do valor foi por fundos dos promotores. Acreditamos no nosso país e gastamos o dinheiro no nosso, no nosso país. Localizada na Zona Econômica Especial Luanda Bingo, esta unidade fabril está situada numa área de 20 mil metros quadrados. A área fabril ocupa um espaço de 820 metros quadrados, sendo que o restante do espaço é destinado as outras fases do projeto. A primeira fase entrou em funcionamento em maio de 2019, fruto da linha de crédito bonificado do programa Angola Invest. Nós fizemos uma panóplia de, de chicotaria. E podemos dizer aqui os, os chouriços escorrente, picante, o extra. Fizemos a morcela. Fizemos bacon, fizemos pinho, vamos fazer muito mais. Nós hoje temos uma, uma gama de produtos. E também, como atendendo o andar de produtos em Angola, nós também estamos preparados para fazer carne de porco salgado. Esta unidade industrial oferece uma gama de produtos integrados na cadeia de valor da carne suína, que vão desde o chouriço corrente, extra, chouriço picante, morcelas e outros produtos semelhantes que aos poucos têm conquistado o mercado nacional. Muito obrigado pela atenção. Meu nome é Luís Nicasso, como já disse, sou PCA da Mestre Aquino Indústria de Carne Limitada. É uma empresa que está no mercado angolano relativamente há bem pouco tempo. Sou empresário há, 20, há 25 anos, mas há cinco anos mudei a minha perspectiva de, de, de negócio por, de, por causa de uma grande oportunidade de alimentação dos, an, dos angolanos. Nós estamos instalados na zona econômica especial. Uh, produzimos hoje 50 toneladas de, de, de carne suína, transformamos 50 toneladas de carne suína, a nossa perspectiva é, no próximo ano, estarmos a, a transformar 150 toneladas de carne por suína por mês em, em enchidos. 
Também estamos alinhados o que precisamos de matéria-prima com um projeto de cinecultura. Estamos a fazer cinecultura, consequentemente o matador, onde que vamos, a, vamos, vamos matar é, suínos e, e caprinos. Essa é uma perspectiva, o que é que a Mestre Aquino faz, o que é que a Mestre Aquino quer, quer fazer. Um valor de investimento neste momento de cerca de 15 milhões de dólares, que vai gerar cerca de 250 postos efetivos de, tra de trabalho. É, Por que a zona económica especial? É, existem dois fatores importantes quando se, se pretende fazer indústria. É energia, e a energia com qualidade e água que não falta. E estes dois fatores nós encontramos na Zona Económica Especial Luanda, Luanda Bengo. Daí a nossa presença na Zona Económica, daí o nosso in incentivo que empresários nacionais e estrangeiros investam na Zona Económica Especial por causa de outros fatores, mas destes dois fatores importantes que às vezes são em África os constrangimentos e obstáculos para uma efetiva industrializa industrialização. E também dizer da grande oportunidade e vantagem de investir em Angola e investir na zona econômica especial. E eu queria aqui fazer um particular, levar a todos nós, os palestrantes e o resto da gente do continente que nos assiste, esquecer Angola um bocadito na perspectiva. Porque até então os negócios nas mentes de, 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 de gente de outros continentes e da África é que Angola era, era o país do petróleo. Angola é o país do petróleo, mas também não é só o país do petróleo. Angola tem outras oportunidades e falo concretamente na água, na água indústria. Falo naquele, no que é alimentar os angolanos. Nós temos, somos cerca de 30 milhões de, de habitantes. Temos aqui, como qualquer coisa, disponível, sem, pesquisa, sem necessário pesquisa e produção, sem, sem necessário plataformas. Temos aqui 500 a 600 milhões de dólares disponíveis todos os meses no que, no que a alimentação diz, diz respeito. Por outro lado também... Estamos aqui com países vizinhos da, na, na SADEC, grandes, consumi, grandes consumidores e no, com necessidades de, de alimentação. Esta é a perspectiva que eu trago para este, este, encontro, este encontro. Tirar de Angola só a prisão de petróleo, mas perceber que Angola, quem quer investir aqui, existe uma grande oportunidade, que é a água indústria. A, grande, a água indústria é ela que vai garantir certamente que é, o capital tem um retorno e, a, e atenção às medidas novas que o governo está, está a tomar que, que é começar a, a excluir alguns produtos que não se podem importar com cambiais, com cambiais do Banco Nacional de Angola porque para obrigar, para obrigar mesmo que nós produzimos aquilo que necessitamos porque isto na perspectiva do Covid na perspectiva do Covid se nós fôssemos um país eh, somos 35, 35% dependentes da importação se não houvesse barcos, nós estaríamos numa ilha e provavelmente morreríamos de fome. Essa é, que é a perspectiva de mudança da mentalidade dos empresários, dos investidores, é produzir em Angola meios de que nós precisamos e, e, e nos, faz, nos fazem falta. Essa é a perspectiva. Daí dizer que, assim sendo, Angola é um país de grandes oportunidades do, agro, do agronegócio, da do, 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 do área de transformados e me fico contente e feliz porque faz, hoje poder integrar e perceber esta dinâmica de uma zona econômica zona econômica da África eh, quando nós às vezes consideramos Well, what I can what I can get from the whole presentation, from the whole intervention, is basically Angola is a country with opportunities. There are a lot of opportunities in the agricultural um, sector as well, and the, in particular, the special economic zone of Luanda Bengo offers uh, something that for them was quite important: energy and water, and this infrastructure that allows foreign investors to operate in a proper, a sustainable way. Um, so, based, based on that, I would like to, to go back to Andrew. Um, I know that your organization focuses a lot on supporting the implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Area. What does that mean for the design and operation of economic zones like the Luanda Bengo? And how could it take advantage of the AFC FTA? 
AFCFTI. Yeah, I always get confused, yeah. but I, I think I have managed to do it well. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks. Um, yeah, Stefan talked about the governance requirements there in terms of, you know, the good operation of uh, an export processing zone or a special economic zone. And I think those points are, uh, you know, very important. However, I do also believe that uh, the success of an export processing zone also partly hinges on which, which are your target markets, where are you going to prioritize? Um, I gave a couple of examples from our subregion, for example, where certain vulnerabilities were revealed precisely because of a dependence on a particular form of preferential market access, which suddenly ceased to exist. So that creates vulnerability. Um, I think Stefan also mentioned AGOA, and effectively it's got five years to run. Currently, the US doesn't look like it's going to be uh, renewing AGOA. It looks like it prefers to do bilateral trade deals. Now, we're living in very uncertain times, and uh, it's, a, it's a big challenge for the authorities when they're designing things like an industrial park about exactly what the focus is going to be, the strategic focus. Uh, we really don't know how the global economy is going to come out of this COVID-19 crisis. Uh, it doesn't look very good in Western Europe or in North America currently. I have noticed that the Chinese economy, actually, its imports have reached a record high in dollar terms it was announced this morning. So the Chinese economy seems to have recovered quite strongly. However, China is really not much of a market for Africa's diversified goods. It's still principally mineral exports and, and oil. That's certainly the case for East Africa, and I believe that's certainly true as well for Angola. And although Af China has preferential market access schemes of its own for African countries, in actual fact, the practical use of that by African countries has been very, very low. I don't know whether Dr. Uh, Wu Yabin would like to come in on this point, but actually I see the opportunities there in the African mar market rather constrained for most African countries. So we have a global context there where things are not looking very good in Europe in the midterm, not particularly good in North America and the Chinese market has proved difficult to access as well. I think it really is the moment to focus on the opportunities which are coming about from the African continent and free trade area. Now, Angola belongs both to SADAC and ECAS, as Stefan was mentioning, but it is not part of the free trade area of those countries. In actual fact, it hasn't, my understanding is Angola hasn't yet ratified the AFCFTA. But the countries which have ratified number now 30 across the whole of the continent. And from the 1st of January, they will start to put in process these tariff reductions. And for the non-LDC countries, which in Southern Africa includes Namibia and South Africa, which have both signed and ratified the AFCFTA, that means from the 1st of January, they will start the process of tariff liberalization. And that will be a five year, a process over five years of elimination on 90% of tariff lines. And I think for, an export processing zone like um, the Luanda Bengal one, it's very important to have this in mind because the African market is one which, despite the very negative impact of this crisis, I think is probably going to rebound quite well out of it. And uh, it will open up a lot of opportunities, particularly in agro processing, the previous speaker was talking about, and also uh, in manufacturing. Particularly. Um, there was a recent World Bank study which was showing that um, income gains up to 2035 would be about 7% uh, for the continent, 450 billion US dollars by 2035, um, an increase in Af intra African exports of 560 billion, which is really a massive amount given the current relatively low level. And most of that increase will be in manufactured diversified goods. So my argument would be, if you wish to accelerate the diversification of an economy like the Angolan one, focus on the African market. Yeah, Perfect. there will be lots of opportunities. Now, the one caveat, Paolo, if I may just say to close, yeah. is currently under negotiation of the rules of origin. And this will impact the way export processing zones uh, exports will be treated within the African continental free trade area. So there is that one issue there, which I think is a very fundamental one that needs to be resolved because uh, you know export processing zones could contribute a lot. 
And I think a country like Angola would be well placed both from the import side to import more from its regional trading partners, because trade currently is very low. Formal sector trade is practically negligible with neighboring countries. And at the same time, also promote uh, Africa as an export destination. So I think that's an important strategic choice. You know, it's not one that's easily made. But I think the traditional thing of always focusing on Western markets sometimes yields its limitations. And that, those are your main recommendations at the moment. I wonder uh, from your side, Yavin, what will be any additional recommendation that you consider? Uh, Eu peço sinceras desculpas, acabei perdendo o sinal um, por algum tempo. Sorry? Uh, uh, aqueles que me ouvem na língua portuguesa. And we have about 10 minutes, sorry? Temos mais 10 minutos. We have about 10 minutes to conclude, so you, you go ahead, Javin. Um, two, three minutes, main, two minutes, main recommendation from your side. Aqueles que me podem ouvir em português, por favor, podiam confirmar-me ou acenar na câmera, se faz favor. Excuse me? Digo, digo. Estamos a ouvi-lo, mas desliga o microfone. Welcome back. Yes. Uh, firstly, I'd like to answer Andrew's uh, question, because he asked uh, if uh, China would be a very ideal market for the African uh, product, especially from the seas. I'd like to answer this uh, question uh, using an uh, example. In this May, you know, all the traders are forbidden to go across the borders, right? Because of the pandemic. But by the aid of uh, Alibaba, which is an uh, e-trader in China, of course, it's a global e-trader, and also cooperated with the United Nations, we hold a, a internet uh, selling party uh, to, say, to, sell, to sell the uh, Rwanda, Rwanda's uh, coffee bean, you know? So there's a 1.5 ton of coffee beans. And uh, can you guess, that, that is the whole uh, sales uh, of the past year from Rwanda to China. But can you imagine how long it takes to finish the deal to different thousands of uh, small buyers from China? Only one second, you know, only one second, 1.5 ton of coffee beans. So, and it's just before the uh, Deputy Secretary of UN. So I think that's a good news for the small and media enterprises of uh, African countries, right? We can use, because in the past, the African continent is very far uh, from China and the, 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 the transportation is expensive. However, by the use of the accumulation of the SEZs, and also by the uh, uh, uti uh, uh, utilization of the e-commerce, we can make it possible to, you know, uh, uh, sell the uh, African products from the SEZs to uh, the vast uh, Chinese market. And in September and in November, early November, China will hold the third session, the third year of the uh, China uh, uh, International Import uh, Exhibition. And I hope uh, all the audience and the people who are interested in can pay attention to that and to see if you can find the opportunity. So that's all uh, something were to reply to the question of Andrew. Uh, I'd like to, because some uh, a friend asked from the Q&A session, uh, I'd like to uh, give some uh, useful, uh, uh, give some uh, suggestions and recommendations from the perspective of uh, IPA, uh, uh, the useful uh, Andrew. So the ZEE as a country, it's the only uh, SEZ focusing on uh, uh, processing and manufacturing is attached of great importance by the Angolan uh, government. However, from the perspective of the current development situation, not many enterprises are operating normally in the zone at present, I mean, and the complete uh, industrial chain and the effect of industrial uh, conglomeration have not been formed. So after the research and evaluation, our suggestion for both Chinese and foreign enterprises who are interested in invest in these uh, seas is to consider the gap of ZEE in processing and manufacturing home appliance 
uh, pharmaceuticals, glass, uh, metal packaging, PVC, and also equipment and uh, sanitary uh, detergents. I think that's the field that we'd like to recommend. African countries usually establish seeds to develop industry uh, with uh, comparative advantage in their own countries. Of course, that's what we thought uh, from the beginning. This process is often accom uh, accompanied by the country's policy. We can see the policy shifting from the import su uh, substitution to export orientation. Also, the business conditions of the African seas uh, will be much better than that of other parts of the host country. Uh, the seas are still rooted in the overall investment environment of the whole country. That's deeply affected by the overall investment environment. Yeah. The political stability and the clean governance and high efficiency and uh, uh, are conductive, uh, are conducive to the healthy development of seas. So in summary, in conclusion, uh, in African countries with favorable macro investment environment, seas are generally well established. For example, in Morocco, uh, over a hundred industrial zones spread across the country and uh, they are economically linked with each other as a network. However, in contrast, Angola only set up its first seeds in 2009, which developed with a comparatively slow progress. So according to the survey, I think, uh, although it's reported that Angola intend to set up new seeds across 18 provinces in the country in the future, no specific action plan has been carried out. Therefore, the synergy and the network effects couldn't be brought into full play. So I think that with that, we have like the main conclusions by now. Um, yeah, we have yeah. five minutes left and I would like to give uh, the space also to uh, Dr. Antonio, who can uh, perhaps refer a little bit to all the questions that we have received. We cannot go into detail to each one of them, so I will be thankful to receive any questions you might have and answer them directly per email. But at the moment, uh, Dr. Antonio, perhaps you can take a bit more about the, the, the whole discussion and what a special economic zone do you have to offer to the investors? Yes, of course. Uh, I believe that uh, with all respect to the comments that were made and to the level of uh, competence of all the panelists and with the quality of insights that were uh, made on the special economics, uh, I would just need to, to make a small comment that uh, I believe that some of the data is not that accurate because it's not covering the latest developments. We need to fill that gap on information, especially to the ones that were referring by um, Professor Huyabin regarding the economic zone, because for the last two years, since uh, the management has been changed and since uh, there is uh, an experience, a positive uh, flow of, uh, of investors, uh, Luis Nicasio is an example of such uh, uh, an, an, an investor. And this is all due to the changes, positive changes that were made from the political uh, reforms that were in place, from the assessment that we had to improve our ratings in doing business, and from the understanding that the ratings in doing business were a reflect for um, a time being that uh, had lasted for a couple of years, and the changes do not occur in uh, one uh, step. So they need to to be uh, covering many aspects of uh, how uh, business is done, how um, the legal system is working, how we need to, to re, re, um, reform the processes and procedures that are related to, to uh, doing business as such, and in positive change in this ecosystem of the, of the special economic zone, we saw that uh, from the last two years, we have almost the same numbers of um, companies uh, and with new projects within the manufacturing sector. You, you mentioned the, the uh, pharmaceutical one, the PVC one. Uh, you also mentioned the, 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 the appliances one. Those three ones, they have already, uh, we have already factories that are doing this. Of course, 
it's uh, when we consider the potential of Angola and we consider the regional potential, and this is what I wanted to, to bring forward as a, a, a contribution, we can even consider if we look at the size of the African market, if we look as uh, it was said by Andrew, the potential of uh, uh, imp not imports from elsewhere or the size of the market in billion of dollars of um, consumer goods that can be due. We even consider that we should move forward by bringing those manufacturers, international ones, just the ones that need logistically to come from China into uh, Africa to establish themselves in a special economic zone like ours, okay? So the water issue that you had before, the, the electricity issues that you, challenges that you had, they are not anymore in place for the current capacity, but we will need to expand. So the viability of those that were looking to implement projects within the, the electrical power generation, it's also an opportunity because they will have the sustainability of the own existence of the special economic zone and the, the um, investment that is going to be made according to a plan. It was strategically important to have a plan to see and look at that plan from all different relevant aspects that will make it um, sustainable. And of course, uh, it was uh, based on uh, referrals to of uh, good practices, international ones, because we are studying this from very deep and also from an understanding where are we starting for. Okay, so it here has been, uh, it's a process. We believe that processes don't uh, happen in one day. Just look at the story of China when you start and uh, time passes very fast. And we really think that uh, Africa is the new milestone in terms of um, uh, potential and in terms of growth for the global economy. Thank you. And there is indeed a lot of interest. I will say we have had over 150 pan a participants from many African countries today in this panel. So I would like to conclude um, with Ahmed Benis. Perhaps you want to give us a final conclusion of this discussion that without doubt has covered all the topics that we plan to do. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Enrique. And thank you, all panelists. I think uh, the deliberation of the day of today was, uh, let's say, a good demonstration of uh, the involvement of the special economic zones in the continent and also uh, our, uh, our main partners, United Nations representative, UNTAD, UNIDO, uh, and, uh, and others. Uh, good demonstrations of uh, the importance of uh, special economic zones in supporting the economic development of our countries. Uh, I just wanted to share um, the, some conclusions and insights that we already advocate within, uh, uh, within our organizations. So the development of special economic zones could, uh, could be based on four major pillars to focus on. The first one is the infrastructures, but why, what do we mean by the infrastructures? It's not the inside or on-site infrastructures, but mainly connecting the special economic zones itself to the outside, the outside environment, connecting the economic zones to the urban area, connecting the economic zones to ports, seaports, dry ports, uh, to uh, let's say the, uh, the facilities, electricity, sewage, uh, drinking water. So all this infrastructure setup has to be met in a way that, all, that it's offer the best conditions for the settlement uh, of, uh, of investors and industrialists that we are targeting. The second major pillar is all the business value proposition and the framework that we have to build up together, uh, to, to, together with, uh, with, let's say, the, the, author the, the authorities. Here we talk about not only the legal framework that has to design the prerogative of the economic zones managers, the developer, but also designing the responsibilities of the investors themselves. And this has to be very clear, very smooth, easy to understand in a way that it's, uh, it could be used as an additional value proposition and selling point of, this, uh, of the special economic zones. In addition to that, uh, uh, all the marketing materials and all the, the let's say, um, the promotional tools that we have to develop to attract investors and also to compete against other uh, special eco uh, economic zones. 
The third major pillar is definitely the government's involvement. So without having a, a total support and a full support from the governments and the local authorities, the SEZ cannot achieve its objectives, simply because the government's involvement show a certain confidence to, uh, to investors and also uh, bring a strong relationship with, uh, let's say, uh, all the, the, the ecosystem that is surrounding the special economic zones. So it's definitely important to have a such involvement through the fiscal incentive, through supporting the legal framework, through supporting the initiatives in trade, through supporting the regional integrations. And of course, the local authorities are one of the key players and the stakeholders. The last pillar, and this is the most important one, it's the skill sets. We should work hard here in Af uh, within the African continent to develop the right skill set, addressing the needs of the investors, uh, addressing the needs of the new activity sectors that we want to host within our, uh, our, our, our special economic zones. And this is key because the, the, uh, the success of an economic zones, the success of uh, the success of our approach cannot be made without transfer of expertise, without uh, sharing experience, without duplic duplicating the best, the, 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 the best, the best, pract uh, the best practices. So we should rely on our resources. And this is my last word, uh, uh, let's say developing the African value proposition for our for our SEZ, not duplicating benchmark that are imported from Asia or from from the US or from from, from Europe without uh, going into deep customization customizations. We are able today as as African to run our special economic zones in a very profitable way with the clear focus on growth, profitability and a create a create a create a creating job and of course attracting FDI. So thank you so much for attending this uh, uh, this outstanding webinar session. Thank you again to uh, uh, to Dr. Antonio and his team for his support for hosting this wonderful uh, the, the, this wonderful webinar. And uh, of course, I will extend my uh, my, uh, my my gratitude to Paula for this uh, outstanding moderation of this uh, webinar. Thank you so much, uh, Paula, and thank you to all panelists. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we are fine. So uh, for 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 our uh, participants and uh, for the one who were sharing some Q and A, uh, we will reply back to that uh, by email. And uh, the next, uh, I think, the next uh, rendezvous uh, will be our annual meeting that will take place uh, early in December. We will keep you posted. Follow us on uh, on our social social media. And thanks again to all panelists and partners. Take care for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Have you. a good day. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you to everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.